Hey everybody, welcome to Hash It Out. I am your host, RJ Balde. In this episode, I'll be talking to Ethan Woods about the role of craft businesses in the cannabis industry. We'll also talk about cannabis cultivation trends in 2021 and more. Without further ado, let's hash it out. All right. My guest today is the co-founder and CEO of Desert Underground, a cannabis company based in Desert Hot Springs, California. Welcome to the show, Ethan Woods. What's going on, man? Thank you, RJ. Just trying to kick off 2021 right. Dig it. I like it. How are we're 13 days in as we're recording this? Yeah. How has it been so far? Uh, for us, it's been very good. We've brought in uh, lots of new strains into the facility um, that are good testers. Um, we got a really good team on board. Morale seems high. We got a vaccine coming to the world, which is super exciting as well. Maybe one day we can yeah. actually go to a restaurant and have a team meeting. That would be fantastic. How are things going for you? <laughs> you know, not bad. We're, we're hanging in. Um, uh, you know, I, I am endlessly grateful um, to, to have been busy over the course of the year because, you know, that's, that's saying more than uh than a lot can say you know um for sure um yeah we so, were super yeah, lucky so I've, been yeah, I've, I've been grateful yeah we you've been lucky, lucky too. in lucky cannabis too? yeah we've been lucky in cannabis i mean 2020 cannabis being deemed an essential business um we had almost zero slowdown if anything we we sped up um and i think you know being able to provide some sort of you know entertainment or wellness product to uh the broader california community um was um was really great for us. And we, I think we've got a lot of consumers that really love our product and um, a lot of new people coming to us over the course of 2020. Mm. How, how does that make you feel about, um, you know, it's been great to hear how well the cannabis industry has done over the course of the pandemic, especially when you compare it to, you know, industries that have almost collapsed under the course of, you know, the past year. How, um, what does that tell you about, uh, how do I frame this? Um, you know, you see the cannabis industry flourishing while at the same time it remains a federally illegal um, I industry, a federally illegal product. Um, you know, a lot of cannabis businesses have had trouble finding financial aid to get through the pandemic. So how do you feel living in that sort of uh uh, like a paradoxal universe. <laughs> yeah, it's, you're almost asking me to get up on my soapbox here for a second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go, it, for it, it, you know, go for it, man. You know, we, yeah, we, we provide a lot of jobs, uh, in, not just in California, but around the nation and around the world now. Um, I think in the U.S., we don't have access to financing. We don't have access to insurance or um, even proper banking services, which can screw you up on the accounting side. And like you said, it is par it's, a, it's a paradox. Um, like, we would love to have access to all of those things. We wish the government would recognize our industry as something that's valuable mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to the U.S. and to our local communities as well. Um, I think that the legislation will take us there. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Um, in the meantime, we work on solutions. We, this whole industry um, kind of came out of, came out of the woodwork and has been trying to credentialize and professionalize itself over the past few years. And for us, you know, the biggest mm -hmm. thing has been just navigating hurdles or rather or rather trying to jump over hurdles and navigate the different problems that this industry has. I mean, going from a startup of four people to 150 employees in just two years time um, was kind of blistering speed. And there's <laughs> lots of lots of different places where we could have made mistakes. But I'm really happy to say that uh, we did an effective job of getting of getting over the hurdles. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been uh, Desert Underground has been in operation for a, a bit over two years now. Is that right? Let's see. We opened our doors um, 2000. Yeah. Early 2018. Um, so uh -huh. we're kind of I guess we're going on three years. Our first building oh, was wow. 2018. Oh, wow. Our second building was 2019. We have about 75,000 square feet of indoor grow. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got 40 different grow rooms that we put on a perpetual harvest um, so that we're always bringing down crops every single week so that we can we can plan out products uh, with our with our customers. Got you. And I understand that for a long time, Desert Underground was 
um, up until recently even was focused majorly on like private label growing for like celebrity cannabis brands. So how so, uh, how did you get into that, and and what was behind the decision to get into that sort of space specifically? I you know in 2018 we kind of took a crawl walk run approach. Um, you know my past has to do with working on the product first, uh, making that excellent, and then bringing that out to the consumer. We knew in 2018 that it wasn't all going to be perfect and rosy to start. So we didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't want to get into the complexity of packaging and branding and defocus from the actual product itself. So we said 2018 and 19, let's focus on cultivation. Um, let's make mm -hmm. all of our mistakes. And when we come up with a product that we think is an A plus, then let's really take that out to the consumers and our own branding. In the meantime, we chose to be a good wholesale partner and uh, being, you know, I, I have a supply chain and a finance background. Uh, and I thought that one of the problems that needed to be solved in this industry in particular, as other people was la were launching brands, um, was to have a business that could create good product, create a great forecast, and then be able to smartly partner um, with the folks that are putting really good branding and packaging together. So as we were coming up with our different strains and forecasting eight months in advance, we had some of the really big hitters and celebrity brands come to us and really like not just the product that we had, but the solutions that we offered them from a supply chain standpoint and kind of bringing that back around to the Desert Underground brand, um, we were kind of underground for two, three years. And so we mm -hmm. rolled that right into what our branding is. Uh, so we are Desert Underground. And now I guess we're, we're a bit more above ground because people are starting to figure out who <laughs> we are, what, our, what our products can offer. I dig it. I dig it. So you planted that seed three years ago and we're breaking... We're breaking ground now. That's what's up. I like yeah, that. I Reaching like... toward the sun. That's yeah. cool. So did you work uh, at all like directly with celebrities, like getting their brands together? Or was that were you sort of like uh, away from that sort of aspect of it? But, see, I've been very much focused on, um, I would say, on the cultivation side of things, on the operation side. Mm -hmm. um, of course, from a sales standpoint, um, we do work with the celebrities um, and we've met with them. Um, we plan with them. Some, I would say they all they all have their own supply chain departments, and they all have their own buyers and stuff like that. So those are typically the people that you're liaising with. Um, mm. But uh, I, I would say we've been pretty highly involved trying to get them the product that they need to make the make the product work for the consumer. Um, like for instance, Tyson Ranch, um, they they use some of our products that are super high THC, uh, and we've been supplying them for for a couple of years. And uh, we've gotten some plugs from uh, from Mike himself. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's not too much interaction with the celebrities themselves, but more the folks in the background that are trying to put the stuff together. Got you. Got you. Right on. Right on. And you've since switched now um, to manufacturing your own line of cannabis products. Is that right? When did you uh, begin doing that? Um, we actually started the planning process mid-year last year. Uh, and we launched back in November. So we're only, what, six to eight weeks in. And the, the line's called Screaming wow. Trumpets. Yeah, tell me all about it. Tell me about Screaming Trumpets. So Screaming Trumpets, um, it's another niche. It, it, it's more of a niche product. Um, we wanted to bring a, a great product, meaning the cannabis itself, and good packaging together. So uh, we, we started to take a look at what wasn't present on the shelves. And we decided to go with more of an old tobacco tin type feel. Um, so it's more of a collectible tin, it's strain specific, um, and on the inside we put a really high quality loose leaf, uh, loose leaf flower that tests typically any bet anywhere between the 20% and 35% uh, THC range. Um, it, it, it's actually wow. supposed to be um, a value play for the consumers because we do recognize it as a company that it is hard times, people do have constrained budgets, and we want to be able to offer people really great product at a really good price point. Um, so we, we, so the inside the tin, you get 10 grams, you get the rolling papers, you get the matches. So it's ready to roll. Um, and we've seen some pretty good Yo. success with that so far. That's dope. That's, that's rad. So you launched that in November. So you're yep. pretty like, how, how has it been so far? How did the launch go? Um, and, uh, how have sales been so far? I think November and December historically have been bad months to launch products in the cannabis industry because there's just so much noise out there. And this year sure, was sure. doubly bad because uh, because we had uh, we had COVID as well and we had constrained budgets. 
However, it's been going well. I mean, in the last two months, um, we've brought on board about 12 to 14 clients, which is a pretty good growth rate from a client standpoint. We do have reorders. Um, we're getting great feedback, not just from the clients, but from the consumers themselves. Um, people seem to really mm-hmm. love the concept and they really uh, adore the quality that's inside the packaging, which is that that's really what we were going for. We wanted to be able to stand out from a quality standpoint, which is pretty much everything that we do. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, it's um, it, it, it's difficult to find that balance between, you know, uh, packaging, marketing and also quality. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, some companies um, for better or worse, like they they end up sacrificing one or the other. So how do you find that balance? Um, it's really again, it goes back to the whole crawl, walk, run. We're not trying uh-huh. We are not trying to blast this product out and sell tens of thousands of tins overnight. Um, Because as you do something like that from a supply chain and a product standpoint, you have to sacrifice the quality that's going out the door. Um, We'd rather have a a, a smaller base, a smaller clientele and people that really love the product and want to come back to it. Um, Maybe more of like a, even more of like a cult following versus some, something that's more um, big box blunderbuss out, you know, everybody knows about it and uses it. Um, so we're going to keep it yeah. small until we can expand. I mean, it's, it's similar to like what a Patagonia did that their business model, they took it slow. They made sure the product was 100% quality and the consumers started coming mm-hmm. to them and asking for things versus you just trying to constantly convince the people that this is what they should smoke. This is what they should buy. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. You're playing the long game. I dig it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right on, man. Yeah, that's rad. I love that. I love the sound of that too. Um, yeah, that, that vibe, that aesthetic, um, I think fits yeah. in real well. Yeah, no doubt. Now, let me ask you, uh, uh, sort of like a more personal question about your history and your experience. Cause I understand that, uh, it was in 20 or not 20, 2009, uh, you received ha- uh, Hamilton college's Bristol fellowship award. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Dig it, dig it. And, and as a Bristol fellow, um, you traveled to, to many countries, right? And I, and I have a description here. You traveled to 13 countries along the maritime spice routes, studying the economics and history of food migration as a result of the spice trade. Absolutely. Man, that's a mouthful. So, yeah. <laughs> so, like, where, I don't even know where to begin. Where, tell me about that experience. I mean, I can only imagine. W- what did you take away from that? And, and how did it end up uh, ultimately affecting uh, the work that you're doing over at Desert Underground? Yeah, I mean, th- that actually, it actually uh, impacts quite a lot about my, my, my thinking and we're, our methodology here uh, at Desert Underground. And I can tell you a little bit about that. The Bristol Fellowship itself is, uh, it's a, it's, it's a scholarship that only goes out to one or two students uh, every every year. You got to write a 40 page paper and go through a bunch of interviews your senior year. Um, I was a geology, uh, I, I, I minored in geology and my major was economics. Um, and so I wanted to kind of put, put those two different um, backgrounds together. And I was also super interested in food. Um, so I chose like you read, you read the whole kind of part of the thesis. I chose to go sure. around to the maritime, around the maritime spice routes, and start to study food cultures and see how spices kind of migrated from east to west over the last two to three thousand years, um, kind of through you know pricing mechanisms and blah blah blah. I don't want to go too far into that, but I would say tying sure. that into cannabis, like what does that actually mean? I, you know, one of the concepts that I came across while I was traveling was slow slow food, right? Um, slow food is a movement that was started in uh, Italy. Um, and uh, by a guy named Carlo Petrini. And what it does is it focuses not just on the product itself, but also the tradition and the people and the methodologies that were that were and are used to make that product. And they kind of create a halo around that brand, right? And it's, it's, it, it, it is directly juxtaposed to like your fast food. Slow food would say, hey, we took our time and love and right. and energy right. and put it into this thing. It's the same thing with what we do here, right? Mm-hmm. We are not super highly automated in our in our facilities, um, and we really do understand that it takes really passionate people to be able to grow some of the best plants. And so we apply that same sort of like craft methodology to everything that we do here, 
Um, so it is a bit more of a high touch environment versus some of the other greenhouse growers, uh, greenhouse growers or other super highly automated facilities that you might see. And uh, it shows in the product. So that's kind of the if you're looking for the direct line between the two, that that that's really it. It's about the methodology. Sure. Sure. I love that. Yeah, I can definitely see that that parallel. Um, wow. I, I, I don't mean that just like brought up like um, a philosophical question that I uh, that I want to ask you now. Um, do you think that in the long run um, versus, you know, what we see of, you know, the big corporations, the the Amazons, the Walmarts of the world or even like the big cannabis companies of the world? Uh, you know, you see how they flourish. You see how they reach trillions, trillions of dollars. And and Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are the richest people in the world. But do you think that in the long run, if we are to sustain ourselves as a human species on this planet, at least the the craft model of business will need to be like the future of business. You know, instead of you compare it to fast food and slow food, you know there are millions of problems that we already know are wrong with the fast food industry. Um, yeah. you know, from the chemicals that they put into our bodies and, and how they treat the animals and beyond. Um, so, and, and then the idea of slow food and, and, and curating what you're doing and, and caring for the ingredients and caring for the people that you're providing these products to. Um, yeah, yeah my, my, I guess my big, blue sky question to you is 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 craft business the way to sustain the human race ethan woods answer life's question please <laughs> i don't know that's that 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 is a very big blue sky question uh, let me let me let me let me phrase it like this let's put it put together a bit of bit of a framework okay. right um okay. you know warren buffett said it best right price, price is what you pay value is what you get right um okay i think there's always going to be a place for um, for the consumer to buy lower priced products or higher priced products, but that's just the price. What's really important is what value do they perceive, right? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, I think there's always in 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 most industries, whether you pick um, whether you pick cheese or chocolate or cannabis um, or alcohol or jewelry, there's always going to be a slot for those brands. That can that can convince the consumer that they've got really good value, meaning that they, they should pay the price for the product that they that they think is right. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the cannabis industry itself, um, focusing on that craft niche is really important for us. We say that we're craft at scale, meaning that we don't just have one big huge room and we're, we grow a lot of we we try to grow as much yield yield as we can out of it. We have 40 smaller rooms that we operate on uh, on a weekly that we harvest on a weekly basis to offer that craft quality at all times. I do think that there's going to be your big big box brands. I do think there's going to be your discount brands and they'll have lower price points because of economic efficiencies. And people will buy that stuff because not everybody can afford to pay our prices. But um, as we start to ride the commodity curve down over the next few years, getting into 2021 through 2025, um, what's going to happen is that there's always going to be these people that have really high premium quality that people are willing to pay for. And that's value. Right. Um, and that's where we that's where we hope to place ourselves as a brand. I see. OK. OK. So there is so there is hopefully room for for both. There is a balance that we can achieve totally. there. Okay. I think so. I, I feel that. I totally I think so. That. But, you know, it, just one quick one quick other than going back to. You know why do people care? You can tie this back to um, mm -hmm. you can tie this back to to food or healthcare or wellness products. Um, more and more people do check in on where the products come from, how they're made. Um, is it sustainable? Um, you know, is it good for me? Right. And I think that all of those sure. things kind of roll into our decision making for every single brand that we um, create here at Des Desert Underground. Got you. Got you. Now, speaking of which, oh, I, I almost forgot to ask you this. Um, uh, you, you mentioned that you launched uh, Screaming Trumpets. I understand that you also have another uh, luxury cannabis brand in the works. Is that true? And how much can you tell me about that? <laughs> Not so much at this point. I can't tell you too much other than we are going gotcha. to launch, probably launch that in uh, 2021, probably more towards the back half of the year because we have to go through the full branding exercise and the design and all of that stuff. 
Right now, what we have is Desert Underground, which is our lifestyle brand. Um, the value brand would be Screaming Trumpets. And then the luxury brand, again, will come in 2021. But for the time being, we still are aimed at being an amazing supply chain partner for our great wholesale brand partners. Dig it. Dig it right on. So 2021, we'll just have to keep our eyes peeled for, for news and announcements when it comes to it. Yeah. Dig it. Sick. And uh, let me ask you, uh, this will be the last thing that I ask you before I let you get back to, I'm sure, the, the, the hella amount of work that you have to be doing right now. Um, I just want to ask you about uh, what you think about uh, cultivation trends going into 2021 as we continue to go through the year. Um, I understand that um, among them, you're anticipating an increased use of uh, beneficial bugs in cannabis growing. Um, yeah. so tell me about that trend and, and do you see any other, do you foresee any other trends going into 2021? I do. I mean, there's, 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 there's a few that are important for us and I think it should be important for the rest of the industry as well. Um, one is the ideal of, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of provenance, the idea of being local, being tied to the community. Um, I think that we as cultivators and just the cannabis business overall need to be tied in with local communities because those are the folks that support us. Um, so that's number that's number one. Um, number two, I would say it's kind of thinking more from our, uh, more of an organic standpoint. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the product that we're um, putting together is as healthy as can possibly be for the consumer. So we don't like to spray and pray, pray and spray, I think is the way they call it. Instead, we like to basically mm -hmm. create a biome in each of the individual rooms um, to combat some of the pests that we've gotten. I mean, most most cultivators have pests. If they tell you they don't, then they're probably lying. So, but what you need to do <laughs> is you need to understand those pests and you need to be able to battle them with other predatory mites. So for instance, you know, the use of Californicus or Acemilis andersoni or Swirsky or nematodes, like these are all uh, different pests that have different usages. And if you keep a healthy, sustainable amount of them in the room, it prevents things that can befall the crops um, before it happens. Uh, instead of seeing a problem and then spraying the plant and then getting an acrid smoke out of the bud or losing THC or having some sort of, um, you know, fungi uh, come into the plant uh, that affects its final testing. So, you know, that, that kind of organic methodology uh, is, is what we are striving to use here at Desert Underground. Um, and as California launches its organic designation, we'll be first in line for that. Oh, dig it. Right on. Do you know, do you have a timeline on that? Do you have an idea of when you can anticipate that or not yet? I knew you were going to ask that question. Um, <laughs> they, rolled out the, they, they rolled out the framework last year um, for the organic designation. Um, and I think uh, they haven't actually given an official launch date, but I would anticipate it is coming in 2021. I think with everything that's happening at the BCC and the different bureaus right now, everyone's kind of Every got, everyone was thrown into a tailspin in, uh, in mm -hmm. 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so we're waiting, we're awaiting further communication from them to know when we can start applying. Right on, right on. Well, we'll have to stay tuned then for all you've got going on over there. Um, uh, before we go here, where can our viewers and our listeners find everything that's going on and keep up uh, with all that you've got going on over at Desert Underground? I would say, you know, the first place to probably stop would be desertunderground.com. Um, you can also find us on Instagram uh, with scre uh, under Screaming Trumpets and Desert Underground if you give that a search. Um, those are the three outlets that we have right now. Um, we are launching a V2 of our website shortly, so you should be able to see all of the different press that's, uh, that, that, that we're also generating as well. Cool. Right on, man. We'll keep our eyes peeled. Ethan Woods, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Keep up the good work, and uh, we're looking forward to see all that you've got going on in the new year. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate you taking the time, RJ. Um, of course. Happy, happy 2021 to all of your listeners. Yeah, likewise, to you and your team as well. Uh, grateful to you, grateful for your time, man, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. My thanks again to Ethan Woods for joining me. If you are a member of the cannabis community and have a story you want to share with us, we would love to hear from you. You can reach the show at hashitout at trichomes.com. You can help others find the show by taking a moment to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. 
You can also join the discussion and get your voice heard by joining the community at trichomes.com and following us on all social media. Hash It Out is produced by David Fortin and presented by trichomes.com. I am your host, RJ Balde, and I'll catch you next time.